feel a little nervous, but turn with me to uh, Psalm 34. Psalm 34. Psalm 8. Oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Now, many of us are familiar with the story of David and Goliath. But after that victory, that event only became a, a roller coaster for David. He found himself in a roller coaster of life. And this is just one of the events in the life of David. And David writes this psalm as a result of just one of the unusual, undesired, and unexpected situations in his life. For homework, you can read it. The background is recorded in 1 Samuel chapter 21, verse 11. See, after defeating Goliath, David became the talk of the town, and that only made Saul jealous. He was a jealous king. He despised David, and when he couldn't take it any longer, he tried to kill David. When David escaped, Saul sent his men after David to kill him. And though innocent, David found himself as a marked man, as a frustrated fugitive, constantly on the run for many, many, many years. There had been previously close calls, but this time seemed like Saul was ready to get David and David had to escape. So this time it seemed like David was healed in. And so not knowing what to do, David decides that he's going to run and seek refuge and protection from this leader named Akish from the city of Gath. Akish was a wicked warrior, and yet David wanted to run to him for protection. It would be almost like, almost like if you had done anything wrong, you were an innocent person, and all of a sudden, uh, you're an innocent man, and you're a fugitive, you're running from the FBI, but because you're running from the government, you're going to run to the F, you're going to run to the mafia for protection. <laughs> You, you see how, you know, you know, you, you know you're innocent, but it's the government that's after you. So he said, well, I'll just run to the mafia for protection. So that's what David did. He was running from Saul. He was an innocent man. And so he says, you know, I'll seek refuge with Akish. And so he gets there. He gets getting close. You can read it in, in 1 Samuel chapter 21. And David is coming up to the city of, of Gath. And then they say, isn't that David? Isn't that that man that killed Goliath? I mean, boy, is it, isn't that David that did that? And the Bible says immediately they put David in chains and, and, and then they're going to take David back to our keys to have him executed. And so now David realized, well, David, that was not such a smart idea. David begins to call it on the Lord under his breath. You know, he, you know how it is when you, everything looks good on the outside and, and you're really calling them up on the inside. And like, Lord, you better get in here right now. And so David began calling on the name of the Lord. He realized the severity of the situation and he said, maybe that was the dumbest thing to do. And so the Bible says that David pretends to be a madman. He pretends to be crazy. He pretends to be insane. And the Bible says, David even let spittle run down his beard. And, and you know how you've seen people, they kind of look, you know, like they ain't really wrapped too tight. And so David had really did this. I can imagine that he probably let his eyes roll in the, in the back of his head and do something, twitch his neck, and some of them dumb things crazy people do, all right? Don't say amen if you're looking at me. So anyway, <laughs> David began to do some of those things. And, and then the king, I he says, is this the man that 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 killed Goliath? Is this the same man where the women were shouting and, and doing the hucklebuck, all that stuff in the street saying David has killed, you know, Saul has killed a thousand and David has killed ten thousand and, and everybody was celebrating being a national holiday because they had killed our man, the Goliath, and now this man and then David was really turning it on, pretending like he was crazy and insane. And he began to he said, look like this man is 14 carat crazy. And so Ike says, get this man out of my sight. He said, I have no use for this man on my staff. And they drove David away. And then it's almost as if to say, there's no sense in, in killing David at this point because he's not competent to stand trial. See, that thing ain't just think it's new. You know, that's the reason why Ike didn't do anything. He's, he's a man man. I know he killed our man. I know he murdered. I know he did this, but he's a bad man. It was almost as if to say, he's 
not competent to stand trial. It was almost as if to say, there's no sense in killing him if he doesn't know why he's being killed. There was no glory in executing a man if the man didn't know why he was being executed. So they drove, his enemies drove him away. And it was out of this close call that David had. David realized this, and he realized of all the close calls I've had, this has got to be in the top ten of the highlights. And he realized that it was nobody but God that delivered him. I tell you, there's no greatest thing to have when you go through something and you accomplish something, whether it be at home, your personal life, on your job, in a ministry, and, and all of a sudden you realize that was nobody but God. That's one of the greatest things, greatest thoughts to ever have. And so David is on his run. He, they've driven him away. He's got to be on the lookout for Saul. He realized Saul has probably come to the city and gone. And so David realizes that he's far away from Achish. He's still on the run from Saul. And the Bible says, so David runs into this cave in the hill country of Judea. Being in a cave, a place with concrete floors, concrete walls. Let me say it again. Being in a place with concrete walls and concrete floors. David turns his cave into a, a cathedral and has the best chest church service he's ever had. I wish somebody was hearing me. And it was out of this episode that David writes to Psalm 34 and says, I will bless the Lord at all times. David runs into a place, a cave, somewhere with concrete floors and concrete walls and turns his cave into the cathedral. And it's right there that he begins to worship the Lord, Pastor Pierce. So he puts down the sword and, and he writes the song. He converts the cave into a cathedral. He transforms the cave, a place of hiding, to a haven of hallelujahs. He takes a place with concrete walls and concrete floors and no stained windows on out there and rearranged the chairs and plugged up some speakers, brother, huh? And, and, and hooked up some choice MP3s and began to have some of the best church he's ever had. Right there at on Stuart Island. That just sort of slipped. Read, read in Psalm 34. Right there. In that cave, on Stewart Avenue, concrete floors, concrete walls, convert something from a cave to a cathedral, to convert something from a hiding to a haven of hallelujahs. He hooks up no stained glass, no this, no that, rearranges chairs, plugs up some speakers, hook up some choice MP3s, praise the Lord, and begin to have some of the best church he's ever had. That's what David did. If you go back and read First Samuel and look at the background of what he did, and when he gets to the cave and he realized that I can worship God right now. Yeah. Yeah. Right where I am. And the Bible says he began to have the best church he's ever had in a long time. And David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mind. David had been so focused on his situation and his limitations that he failed to focus on the one and only God. You know, the one who sits high and looks low. The one who's able to reach down and save you with his right hand. The one who always has the last word in all situations. David was so consumed with the situation that he failed to realize that God is still worthy to be praised regardless of the situation. And it's out of this chapter of his life that he says, I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall continually be in my mind. Not just on Sunday mornings. Not when I get a good report from the doctor. But even I'm going to bless the Lord if I get a bad report from the doctor. Not just when I have a few nickels in my pocket, but I can bless the Lord right there in the unemployment line. Not when I just have a job, even when I don't have a job. Right in the midst of not even knowing what to do, His praise shall continually be in my mouth. And that's how it is sometimes of life. In the midst of a great emotional escape, in the midst of a chaotic situation, sometimes even if we messed up ourselves, when we turn our focus to God and let the peace that we have with God manifest itself to the peace of God, we settle down, calm down, and we let our soul make her boast in the Lord. 
The songwriter says, when I think about the goodness of God and all that he's done for me, my soul cries out, what? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And so when you feel like you're between a rock and a hard place, just think on the goodness of God. And I guarantee, I guarantee that sooner or later you will break out in praise. When David called his breath, he was breathing hard. You remember that deep in court sometimes, you know, ripping and running and did all that stuff in karate. And one last thing they didn't do, they said, now slow down, mm -hmm. sit down, catch your breath, would it be? <laughs> you know, and when David found it, he called his breath and began to focus and, and reflected on the goodness of God. That's when he, he turned around and wrote this song, I will bless the Lord at all times. He couldn't help but break out in the praise. Now, 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 that's just the background. We just got to get to the text. Amen. But I promise I'll be short this morning. Amen. <laughs> so, so we won't, you know, we, we, we'll do it again in detail. But it's right still on the name. We get it to Brother Hicks. I know everybody's name. So if I, if I call you out, it's because I'm trying to, I'm just trying to get it up here. Amen. All right. So I see you, Sister Brooks. All right. Okay, so David, David, David said, I will bless the Lord at all times. And so, so we want to spend about five minutes of teaching. I got a squeeze of teaching in here. Yes, right? Squeeze of five minutes of teaching, then we get back to the this sermon. So now the first five books of the, of the Bible, we call that the Mosaic Law or the books of the law. All right, the books after that, you know, Joshua, Judges, Kings, Chronicles, and whatever, call that the books of history. Right, right, right. And then at the end of the Old Testament, we call those the books of prophecy, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and because they all speak of and prophesy the coming of the Messiah. Well, couched in between all of that, the law, the history, and prophecy are the books of poetry. Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Son of Solomon. Amen. And so we are in the book of Psalms. So it's a lot of poetry and it's, and it's a lot of talking about the aspiration of Christ. And some of the Psalms were songs that they sang in worship. And some of them were responsive readings that they uh, read in the temple. We'll talk about the other Psalms when we get to another Psalm for a sermon. Amen. And so we see that in the Psalms, the words may not rhyme in sound, but some of them had a particular pattern. A, A, B, B, C, C, or either A, B, C, A, B, C, or they had some type of pattern. And you're probably saying, why should we study that? Well, we need to study that sometimes as well. And so in this thing, in this particular psalm, David sets it up as a responsive reading, right? As a responsive reading that they would do in the temple. And it has a pattern where every other clause repeats the first clause. What do you say, Pastor? Well, I'm glad you asked to watch this. And so the worship leader in the church would say, I will bless the Lord at all times. And then the congregation would really just say the same thing. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. You know how we see. You see, y'all do. You see the preacher do it. You see somebody do that. And so, in other words, I will bless the Lord is just another way of saying his praise shall, his praise shall be in my mouth. Amen. Everybody see that? Oh, yeah, that. All right. You know. And so, in other words, to say continually is just another way of saying at all times. So that's what David does. The worship leader would say, oh, magnify the Lord with me. And then the congregation would say, let us. Y'all, y'all don't know what y'all wrote the song. Y'all see how David does that? And so sometimes, sometimes we haven't even studied that. As, as Bible students, you're probably saying, how is that going to help me? Because sometimes we study that even though we don't know what it's doing to us, the Bible says the Holy Spirit will bring back to remembrance those things we study. And it might be five years from now. Might be five days from now, you know, might be five months from now that, that you're praying for God for some type of situation and it might come all the way back to the stuff we put in and didn't know why we was doing it. Amen. All right. So so that's why. All right. So I'm glad y'all I asked some good questions. Tell me this sister Zachary. She asked good questions. All right. All right. And then the other reason why I, I try to do this every now and then, I ain't going to bore you all the time, but sometimes we need to see these little patterns because Deacon Corky likes to read from 
Eugene Peterson translation, right, right? And he lays it out, paraphrasing that great poetic form. And, and I like that, but, I, but I, I, I think about people like uh, the Isley Brothers, who are some of the most talented musicians on earth, but you know they songs ain't really that church, but they ain't churchy at all, right? But they grew up in the church. And one of the problems is because the church did not allow them to develop their gift, they let the world develop their gift. Right? Nikki Giovanni, she's from Lincoln Heights, just like the Isaac was one of the greatest poets on earth. A lot of her poems kind of, you know, a lot of profanity, you know. But she's a great poet, right? And she grew up in the church. But because the church was not there to help her develop her gift, she let the world develop her gift. And if we had some young folks and young teenagers, and we, they said, what do you want to be? Oh, I want to write music. I want to do this and I want that. And they actually studied some of the songs and see how God laid out their power. They will be some talented folks. And we don't have to wait for Eugene Peterson. I'm saying God is trying to raise up some Eugene Petersons right here to our young people to write the next poetic book. Somebody, you know, we ain't got to buy Sunday school books. God wants to raise up a Sunday school writing teenager right here in the church. And we have to make sure they are exposed to some of this. Everybody with me? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Don't look at me crazy now. And Pastor Peter, come here and tell them that, you know, so, are y'all with me? And so we have, you know, so people know when I say, now nah, this song's A, A, B, B, some of you are always, what does that got to do with helping me in my finances? I, I understand that. But the Bible says the word of God is good for doctrine and reproof, so we got to go through some of that boring stuff. I, I get excited about it, but some of y'all, I know, you know, look boring. So anyway, so I said I was only going to spend five minutes, amen? And so, and so, back to the psalm. So that's how David lays out the psalm. And so, you know, and so if you were a real uh, scholar, you would study the pattern and from a music standpoint. But God just might be blessing you when you want to write music. All right, all right. So anyway, so back to the psalm. And so in this first few verses of the psalm, and we're almost done, we see elements of what I call a proper praise. David resolved that he would praise God no matter what the situation. And he shares several truths about how we ought to praise God. First, he says that we should praise God personally. We said it before, nobody can praise God for you. You got to praise him for yourself. With everything being sent overseas, outsourced, backsourced, downsized, right size, nobody can send your praise. You can't contract that out. I went to my brother's house last night, and this house is all second best house, decorated house on the street. And me and my other brother said, you know, we said pay somebody to do that. You know, you know that lazy, some of you know, he ain't nothing. You scratch that from the paper. You know, he said, we know he ain't got, he contracted that out. Right, it's good, you know, contract this out. Pay somebody to do that. Pay somebody, to, of course, he's a preacher. He knows. He says, but no, your praise with God is the only thing that can never be contracted out. David said, he said, that praise, praising God should be personally. Nobody can praise God for yourself. David decided that his praise would be unlimited in his range, unconfined in his reiteration, unrestrained in his reach, and even unselfish in, it, in his rejoicing. David did say, let us exalt his name together, but there ought to be times in your life when you're not even concerned with what anybody else do. Some folks can't raise their hand and let somebody else raise their hand first. Some people can't stand up and let somebody else stand up first. But there ought to be some times in your life that you say, if you don't want to praise them, don't hinder me. There ought to be some times when we reflect on God and you say, you know what? I just can't help it. I'm just going to do it anyway. I don't care where I'm at. I'm just got to praise them for myself. David says, David says, let us exalt his name together. But yet, it ought to be times where we ought not be concerned with what other people say or do. So often people come and leave worship services and they say, you know, I didn't really get anything out. My daughter used to say, I left this church. She said, I didn't get anything out. I said, you didn't go to church to get anything out. You went to church to put in. 
You went to church to praise God. If you do get out, that's great. That's a benefit. You went to church to bless God and be a blessing to somebody else. You didn't go to get anything out. So if you ain't getting anything out, shame on you. You went to put in. You know, yes, sir. You know, but that's how it is. So often people say, I didn't get anything out. Well, you didn't come to church to get anything out. You come to church to put something, you made it personal. But not only is praise personal, sometimes it must be verbal. David said his praise should be where? In my mouth. Now, if we had time, you can go to another sermon for another day. I will tell you, you need to put your money where your mouth is, but that's another sermon for another day. If we had time, we would look at Ephesians 4 that tells you that you walk out of match your talk, but that's another sermon for another day. And so I even know that in deep, different denominations that in different cultures, they praise God in different ways. You know, I mean, other people that are not African-American, they tend to be laid back, amen? You know, and they're saved, you know, they Baptist, and, but, but they play the kind of music that, that doesn't really make you pat your feet, you know. Play music that don't really, you know, and, and I work with some of these folks, and after 34 years of working with them, sometimes I'm laid back, you know, you know, so I understand that. They kind of kind of nerdy, and even though we do love the Lord, but 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 it ought to be something every now and then that ought to make it just just pat your feet when you think about the goodness of the Lord, you know. And so I don't mind if I go to a, you know, I don't mind, you know, if I go to a church and, and where everybody just sit still and, and play elevated music for their sermon, you know. You know. I, I don't have that problem because I've seen them lead people to Christ. So I said, well, that's just not that comfortable. But something is wrong if, if God doesn't do something for you every now and then to just sort of make you, you know, you know, shake and, and pat and jump and, you know, something's wrong, you know. I think you need to check your religion if you, you know, you can't feel, you know, you can't pat your feet at least once in a while. And so David says, not only is our praise personal, sometimes it's just going to have to be verbal. David said, this praise shall what? Be in my mouth, not just in my checkbook. You can't write the church a big enough check and say, that's why I just, I just give money and I ain't got to do all that. No, every once in a while, you're going to have to, you know, pat your feet. You know, if you, if you don't, something's wrong. Something's wrong. All right, let's keep moving on. And so, something's wrong if, if you're not excited to have a pep in your step or thinking about the goodness of God. You may not take off running like Pastor Pierce. You may not get caught up like Brother Lenny, but something's wrong if you don't be still like that once in a while. Amen? Amen. Because there's been times I thought about God, and you know, I wanted to just take off running. And I said, oh, no, wait a minute, that's not me. You know, and I kind of held it back, which is not mine. I'm not saying do that. You know, but I'm just saying, I'm just confessing. That's what I've done. And I waited till I got home and, and then start shouting, you know, because that's kind of how I was raised for 34 years. But something is wrong. Something is wrong. I would, I would question somebody's religion if they got a religion that don't make you feel good every now and then. Amen? Amen. You know, this one boy was flying a kite and, and uh, uh, you know, this guy comes up. He says, what you doing? He says, flying a kite. The kite was so far up in the sky. And the guy said, I don't, feel, I don't see a kite. Guy, little boy, yeah. And the guy says, hey, kite been blown away. He says, no. And he, he says, how do you know what's up there? He says, because I feel this tug every now and then on the street. And that's how it is when we're God. We may get, you know, in a rut sometime, but something's wrong if you don't feel that this tug. And, you know, if you ain't got that tug in a while, you need to check yourself. Amen? Amen. Try to close out. So not only, so David says, I will bless the Lord at all times. He says, not just in my mouth, but with not just my checkbook, but with my mouth. Then he says something else. He says, not only is praise personal and verbal, he says praise is continued. Whether it be finance, health, work, emotional struggles, praising God is always step one and crucial keys to victory. You remember, he says, I give all the praises to God. Your faith will be boasted. When you magnify God, you are no longer saying, look how big this problem is compared to me, but rather look how small the problem is compared to God. But not only will praise boast in your faith, fears will be banished and foes will be beaten. I know that because I remember King Jehoshaphat. 
You remember three kings were coming upon uh, the children of Israel, and uh, and it's out of that, it's out of that episode from Second Chronicles 20 and 21 that Yolanda Adams wrote that song, The Battle is Not Yours, but it's what? It's the Lord's. And so that was that episode that she wrote that song, and Jehoshaphat was getting ready to go to battle. Getting ready to go to war. And God told him, he says, I want you to line up your choir singers. And the Bible says he put all of his musicians in front of the army. Now how you going to go to war and you got all your musicians? They ain't got no sword. They ain't got no weapons. All they got is praise. And they defeated the enemy through paying praises of God. And they said, Jehoshaphat, here comes the enemy. He goes, where are my tears? You know? <laughs> Jehoshaphat, here comes the enemy. Sopranos, get up front. Jehoshaphat, here comes the Where's my altos? And he lined up and put the choir in front of the army. And the Bible says, when the praises of God went up, the enemy was confused. Yeah. That's what we have to practice. I need to practice it on my job when the enemy goes around. I just send up praises and it's sure enough to you some folks. Yeah. Right? <laughs> Sometimes they think I'm stone crazy too, but it's okay. That's okay. When we just praise God, that's what peaceful demonstrations are. It's praising God. You done done all this, so I'm going to show you how peaceful I can be. It's hard. It's hard. I know it's hard. It's hard. It's hard not to get rubbery with me, and it's hard not to get that rubber in you. You know why I told them, I know, I know. It's hard just to keep the rubber out the neck and put the praises in the hands. And the Bible said it will. It will confuse the enemy. Try to quote. So Paul says, in all things, give thanks, for this is the will of God. David said, this poor man cried out. And to be poor means to be humble. We know that because Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for they shall be covered. And talking about those who are spiritually bankrupt and humble and recognize that they need God every day for daily bread. True blessings come only to those who trust, fear, and seek the Lord. And it starts with unconditional praise. I wish we had time to talk about it, but David uses these words for praise and blessings and, and blessings. Blessing means Barak is the Hebrew word Barak, where we get the Aramaic word Barak, Barak Obama means to be blessed. And it was a song a long time ago, uh, Toda Shabbat, praise the Lord, and yes. some Toda, and break. these are all the Hebrew forms of praise, right, in this text, if we was in Bible study. And so some of the praises are with hands, some of the praises are bowed down, some praises are with their verse, and, and some of the praises is this Hebrew word, Hela, but we get hallelujah, means shine the spotlight on Jehovah. And so David says, I'm just going to do all of that. When I think about the goodness of the Lord and all that he's done for me, David says, God just delivered me. And I got to this cave and I thought I was so busy hiding. He said, well, I can turn my hiding into a haven of hallelujahs. I can turn this cave right where I am to a cathedral. And right in my situation, right in the unemployment line, right in the doctor's bed, right in the nasty divorce, right in the losing of love, right in the midst of my situation, I'm going to praise the Lord at all times. His praise shall continue to be in my mouth. David says, oh, taste and see that the Lord is good. Oh, taste and see when you're lonely, he will be your comfort. Oh, taste and see when you're afraid, he will be your light and your salvation. Oh, taste and try him. He said, you are like him. Taste and see when the wicked, even your enemies and your foes, come upon you to eat up your flesh. They will stumble and fall. David said, oh, taste and see when things go bad. He makes all things work together for good. He's all taste and see. I dare you to triumph. You will like him. Taste and see that he will lead you beside still water. Taste and see that he will lead you in the path of righteousness for his name's sake. Pray, taste and see that goodness and mercy will follow you all the days of your life. David says, don't just believe my report. Triumph for yourself. Test and see. Thou shall be blessed. God bless you. Let us pray. Our Father and our God, Lord, we thank you for your word. Thank you for reminding us that our praise should be unrestrained, unconfined, and, uh, and unreachable in its range. And that in all of our situations, we can praise you. We recognize we can do this only through a relationship uh, with you. 
and we recognize we do that by leave, believing the report. With the report, what is that? That all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. And that man is separated because of that sin. But Jesus Christ died for our sin. The Bible teaches us that if we will believe that report that Jesus died and after three days got up from the grave, that we shall be saved. And when we accept that report, we can renew our relationship with you. Sometimes we recognize we fall out of fellowship, but we thank you that we can always uh, come back to fellowship, but we'll never lose our relationship. And so we thank you for this, recognizing that we can just praise you in all of our situations. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.